Like this video is about um, uh, gang stalking, uh, which I, I, I mentioned in one of my other videos a while back. And um, I read something about gang stalking years ago and I couldn't remember where I read it. And I finally found it again. It's in a book called Kooks by Donna Cossey. Um, from 1994, which uh, was published by Feral House, fantastic book, and um, I remember I bought this from Forbidden Planet when it came out, or, or maybe Compendium in Camden Town, in the days when, days before the internet, and um, it's, a, it's a great book, it's like a, a compendium of crazy things um, that she put together. Actually, I'll read from the introduction how it it came about. Um, the research for this book began 10 years ago when living in San Francisco, I became the recipient of countless homemade flyers handed to me and other passers-by on the street. If they were advertisements for bands or announcements of a grand opening, I would have thrown them away immediately. But these dense tracts were desperate pleas from the victims of mind control or mad saints who detailed a theory that would solve all the world's problems, or obsessed litigants who described their legal quandaries with the aid of inexplicable numerical equations. Handwritten or typed, their authors usually covered every inch of space on the paper, no matter its size. These flyers were so intriguing that I couldn't throw them away even though I really didn't know what to do with them. When in 1984, I began to publish a little Xerox magazine called False Positive, I finally found a home for the tracks. I reprinted them either whole or in part and called this section of the magazine the Kooks Pages. I realised that my collection was too small to sustain an ongoing Kooks section and suggested that those with similar material could send it to me. Soon readers were mailing literally boxes full of books, pamphlets and flyers and my apartment became Kooks Central. So that's a little introduction of how she came to write this book, how she put it together. So yeah, like I said, I remembered there was this this um, piece that somebody had written about gang stalking that she, she'd received, like a letter. Um, or that somebody had sent her, that they'd been given, that they forwarded to her. And I'll just read it now, because it's got so many parallels with the whole targeted individual gang stalking thing um, that that people talk about on, um, on the internet now, on YouTube. Um, but this is from, it was actually written in uh, 1982, I believe. The book's from 1980, 1994, but this was... It was from 1982 that this was this was actually um, that that she received this, or when it was written. Um, and she says it's headed "I am followed everywhere," and she's got a little bit at the beginning. Says, "Believe it or not, the letter below is a mere excerpt describing an elaborate scheme of skullduggery by police and bystanders playing street theatre. The missus the missive was simply titled." Untitled letter. So this is untitled letter. <clears throat> it's quite long. Upon returning to New York, I began looking for a place to live. I looked at around ten apartments and called to inquire about several others. Since the secret police had already selected and prepared an apartment for me, this proved to be a futile endeavour. I signed a two-year lease for apartment 24 at 620 East 11th Street and moved to the building in November. The apartment provides me with a place to live, but it also provides the secret police with a living environment they control. The building where I live, the surrounding buildings and the neighbourhood serve as a, th as a theatrical set and the tenants of my building Neighbourhood characters and intelligence agents stage a theatrical production. Controlling the immediate neighbourhood is a security measure and it allows maximum freedom of action for staging operations. 
The building I live in is connected to four other buildings. When I look out my only window with a view, one window is boarded up, sorry, in brackets, one window is boarded up and three others face an interior light well, close brackets, I see the back row of buildings on 10th Street. These buildings form a unit that is flanked by three empty lots. The secret police use these nine buildings for staging operations and own some or all of them. The buildings may have been purchased, but it is very likely that they were acquired from the city of New York through Mayor Koch. The city government owns many buildings in the area due to non-payment of taxes and abandonment. I believe most of these buildings have no tenants or caretaker tenants. The two largest buildings were being renovated when I moved to my apartment and appeared to be almost tenantless until the summer of 1982. Either they acquired tenants that summer or the secret police expanded a greater effort to make them seem inhabited. The two buildings were renovated at a minimum cost of $500,000 each, so even if all the other buildings were acquired from the city, the secret police spent over $1 million to provide me with a $115 a month slum apartment. The basic strategy of the secret police is to be ever present at all times and in all places. They make themselves as intrusive, oppressive and inescapable, an inescapable presence. They involve themselves in every detail of my life and are present everywhere I go. At first I dismissed the strategy of being ever present as silly game playing. But the intelligence agents responsible for planning operations clearly intended their use of thousands of collaborators to be a form of non-violent harassment. A psychological assault designed to have a negative psychological effect. Being ever present is intended to be more of an invasion of consciousness than an invasion of privacy. Being ever present is used as a means for stealing reality and thus the ability to function normally in a real world. The secret police have impassed upon me a substitute reality. They have dismembered and appropriated the real world and placed me in a labyrinth of intelligence operations. It is difficult to relate to and impossible to adjust to the artificial, arbitrary and hostile living environment the secret police have created. By being ever present they try to turn the most commonplace life experiences and the act activities of daily life into a maze-like obstacle course and to make the living of everyday life a frustrating, unnatural and disorientating experience. <clears throat> Since secret police operations began, I usually made a note of a detail or incident only if I stood out as unusually intrusive. Oh, sorry, only if it stood out as unusually intrusive, offensive or bizarre. Sometimes I kept daily accounts of every aspect of secret police operations and listed every encounter with an agent or collaborator. These are just random people in New York City, agents or collaborators. Um, basing an estimate on the days and weeks when I counted agents and collaborators and acknowledging that the nature and intensity of operations has changed over the years. I believe that a minimum of 40,000 American citizens have, have participated in secret police operations since they began in 1977. I assume this 40,000, um, he's saying these are people that have participated in these operations operations against him since, he, since he's been documenting this um, has, been, has been happening. It is a curious reversal of everything this country has ever stood for that two presidents Many of their closest associates and supporters and personnel of law enforcement agencies now constitute the single largest group of citizens engaged in organised criminal activity. <clears throat> I am followed everywhere, partly as a security measure, but also because it is necessary to know where I am at all times in order to conduct secret police operations. At any given moment, several intelligence agents work together choreographing street theatre and surveillance operations. Agents and collaborators follow me on foot and in vehicles while maintaining radio contact. They pass me on like a relay team passes on a baton. Most of the surveillance agents appear to have been recruited from the FBI and the New York City Police Department. 
After observing my behaviour and interest for over five years, it is not hard for intelligence agents to predict where I am likely to go out and where I am likely to go. Whenever I leave my apartment, it's kind of rationalising it now, whenever I leave my apartment, I encounter intelligence agents, collaborators and a theatrical production stage managed by the secret police. After several years, this provocative annoyance has come to seem rather like running the gauntlet, a form of military punishment in which an individual is made to run between two rows of men who strike him as he passes by. While descending the stairs from my apartment, I usually meet one or more of the tenants trying hard to look as if they live in the building or staging a scene for me to observe. You know, remember, this is in a pretty busy area of Lower East Side, New York City in 1982, and it wasn't like it is now in 1982. It was pretty rough there at the time. Um, bloody rough. I used to have a friend who lived there, and it was all burning tyres and... and no-go areas. As I left the building one afternoon, two fat men stood with their backs against opposite sides of the narrow first floor hall, so that I had to turn sideways and step between them. Frequently groups of men are standing on or sitting on the stoop when I go out or come in, sometimes blocking the steps so that I have to ask them to move. Several times a week one or more collaborators walk by me just as I step outside. On days when it is felt some special intimidation is necessary, a police car will drive by as I go out and again as I come home. When I go out, I almost always head west, walking through the intersection of 11th Street and Avenue B, since I then might head in any of three directions. This is the only place that operations can be planned for with near certainty that I will enter into the stage scene. The secret police operations I encounter at this intersection are usually more elaborately detailed and choreographed than they are elsewhere, and it is very likely there are hidden cameras. There are usually twice as many people around this intersection as at any other in the neighbourhood, frequently from 10 to 20 people. A corner with a hardware store, a sometimes open grocery store, and two abandoned buildings is not likely to be a favourite neighbourhood hangout. Yet there are often groups of Puerto Rican and black men standing around. Often one or more collaborators would be placed on each corner so that the only way I can avoid them is to walk in the street. As I approach the intersection, a signal is given and people, most of whom are young men, start crossing the intersection from every direction. People walking on the sidewalks, boys riding by on bikes and other people driving by in cars. Intelligence agents frequently use this kind of collaborator saturation placement at other intersections. This operational technique became obvious when several times after having gone through intersections that were inexplicably busy in New York City, right, I stopped to count the number of people and vehicles that moved through the intersection during the next few minutes. The majority of collaborators have been involved in one basic situation, a male child or a handsome young man, in brackets sometimes an orderly looking or older man, close brackets, presents himself to be looked at while other people observe me. Presumably, if I look at the conspicuously displayed bait, the observer witnesses claim to have seen proof of sexual interest or an attempted sedu seduction. Within this basic situation, the secret police have devised a relatively limited repertoire of scenes, but with infinite variations. The actors have basic roles and patterns of interaction. It is somewhat like watching the same play over and over, but each time with a new cast. A few thousand such scenes were staged to create incidents that could be used to discredit me, to manufacture evidence that I was immoral, and to make a fictitious propaganda portrait of me seem to be true. It's like he's living in um, Franz Kafka's The Trial. Um, more time and effort have been invested in staging such scenes that, any, that in any other single aspect of secret police operations. Intelligence agents made such encounters the centrepiece of their operations because political leaders found that making an issue of homosexuality was their most effective means 
of gaining political support for a criminal conspiracy. So I'm assuming from this, this guy, George Dahl, who wrote this, I'm assuming he's gay. And obviously in 1982, um, attitudes towards homosexuality were still a lot, a lot different from um, how they are today. It was, it was still pretty, you know, coming out was like a real big thing then. Every system of morality, whether based on religious beliefs or philosophical principles, is concerned with the difference between right and wrong. Without defining what is right and what is wrong, everyone can nevertheless agree that morality is a hierarchical system. There are greater and lesser evils, and there are greater and lesser goods. It is a widely distorted sense of morality that considers two human beings expressing sexual desire or love for each other degenerate and immoral while considering a political conspiracy to violate a citizen's constitutional rights, the creation of an illegal domestic secret police, the police state tactics of an intelligence agents and the suspension of the country's system of government by the rule of law to be matters of no importance. Oh, bloody hell. On Tuesday, September the 8th, I left my apartment around 3.30 intending to pay my Con Edison bill. Just as I stepped out of the building, a car that was waiting a few feet from me pulled away from the curb, accelerating rapidly, burning rubber as if it were in a drag race. The secret police frequently set up similar incidents as a distraction. I believe the screeching tyres and the brazen display of contempt were intended to induce angry thoughts that would preoccupy me and influence my behaviour. As I walked to the Con Edison office at Fort Irving Place, I counted 16 collaborators engaged in street theatre. The next day, I encountered at least 20. At the Con Edison office, I looked in the window. The office was unusually crowded and the bill-paying line seemed suspiciously long. Hey, I just got deja vu. I was generally apprehensive about entering a trap, not deja vu about reading this, just genuine deja vu. I left, I lost my place, entering a trap, so I decided to come back the next day. I left my apartment around 3.05pm on Wednesday. Walking across 14th Street, I looked at every newsstand for a copy of the New York Times so that I would have something to read while waiting in line. Over a two-year period, I frequently bought or saw papers late in the afternoon at the various newsstands. It is highly unlikely they would have all been sold out. I believe intelligence agents asked the newspaper sellers to hide the papers so that I would have nothing to do while waiting except to observe the planned operation. Inside the main floor customer service, service office, intelligence agents placed a minimum of 25 people and it seemed as if all the employees had been given some sort of briefing and were participating in secret police operations. I joined the bill-paying line. There were around 10 people in line, and as I approached, two young men placed themselves directly ahead of me in the line. Within a few minutes, around 15 more people lined up behind me. There were five bill-paying windows. While I waited in line, the clerks closed their windows until only one window was left open for customer service. The four people in front of me all went to the same window. I believe this was a delaying tactic to keep me in the office for a longer period of time. While waiting in line, the secret police operation being staged was very obvious. Seven young men presented themselves to be looked at and a man and a woman each walked by me twice, staring holes through me. The situation reminded me of the movie The Sting. Sting operations are frequently used by law enforcement agencies. Police agents create and operate fictitious companies as a means of entrapment. In this case, intelligence agents set up an elaborate but thinly disguised covert operation within the office of a legitimate business. A few weeks earlier, I found myself surrounded by game-playing collaborators in a line at my bank. I became angry and denounced them for participating in secret police operations. You can imagine the scene. I believe intelligence agents chose to restage a similar scene in Connor Edison's offices 
hoping to elicit the same or a similar response. An angry outburst that could be used as proof that though that through paranormal powers I had somehow triggered the transformer malfunction and resulting blackout. I was in the Con Edison office about 10 minutes from approximately 3.20 to 3.30. The power failure began at 3.24. I believe intelligence agents committed an act of sabotage. Time to coincide. Uh, time to coincide with a pro provocative secret police operation being staged in Con Ed Edison's office. The secret police involved at least 40 people, many of them Con Edison employees, in staging their scene in Con Edison's office. Although these people were intended to witness an angry outburst, they were also witnesses to the fact that intelligence agents were expanding a great deal of effort to manufacture an incident. And that was written by George Dahl, like Roald Dahl, George Dahl. Um, and I read another thing like that in one of these books, but I can't find it. I can't remember where it was. Anyway, that's that. 19, 1982. Um, documented uh, uh, somebody somebody experiencing what is known as um, gang stalking or a, 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 a retro targeted individual. Um, anyway. Yeah, that's that. Great book, Donna Cossey, Kooks, Feral House, 1994. Um, 250 pages? 250 pages of stuff like that, but not all stuff like that, but all kinds of uh, weirdness. Very good book, classic book. Buy it.